and welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It is time for us to talk about liberty and the current situation in the United States, where we are headed and what we can do about it. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, and joining me by phone today from an undisclosed location, we have uh, the owner, or one of the owners, I should say, of Bighorn Enterprises, also a sponsor of the show, uh, Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Morning, Steve. Thanks for braving the cold. <laughs> so, you know, and is it uh, is it chilly in that undisclosed location where you are right now? Yeah, it's about 45 above. Okay, it's 40 below here in Fairbanks this morning. Thank you so much for rubbing that in our faces, collectively. Uh, <laughs> well, is there something pressing on your mind today that you'd like to talk about in terms of what is going on, or would you like me to prime the pump? Well, nothing pressing. I've been pretty, uh, I think it's been pretty interesting. I'm sure you've been following it, too, this uh, wave that seems like Ron Paul's been getting. Not necessarily, you know, we talk a lot about voting, not voting, and uh you know, one man can't change anything. But what I've been pretty impressed with his idea, which is I think a lot down the lines what you and I talk about every weekend. You talk about every all day, every week. Liberty's catching on. It, and maybe it, exciting. you know, Josh, I don't want to uh, stomp on your little Liberty dream and and rub it into the ground too too terribly. <laughs> okay. Uh, however, I I do want to point out that you know so much of us uh, everything is local in terms of politics. And we yeah. are we are told again and again and again to place our trust in the process, to, to vote in the right people, and things will change. You know, and people get all excited about liberty, and then they get motivated to get out there to the polls, and then we end up electing people that we really think are going to make a difference. And then we see things like what happened Thursday night at the borough meeting. Now, I understand you're in an undisclosed location, and you may not have heard what happened Thursday night at the borough meeting, but let me fill you in. Yeah. There was a vote to accept... $800,000 of federal money for the express purpose of running advertisements to, quote, educate the public on the perils of burning wood. Nice. Okay, so here we have almost a million dollars, and I'm sure absolutely no strings attached to that money, which, oh. is, which is, of course, have completely free money because it's coming from the federal government, that is going here to help educate us to, to put it to put it down the map or, or re-educate you might say i mean basically what it is it's it's propaganda and and it is <laughs> i i don't know if it's a blatant attempt to try to buy off the media sources that have been critical of the borough but that's where that money is going to because that eight hundred thousand dollars is being funneled directly into advertisement to go out there and try to convince us not to burn our own wood or to, or, or to, quote, educate us on how to do it correctly, because, of course, we're all too stupid to be able to do it on our own, and we must be told how by mommy government. You now, what's fun about that is, uh, let's see, the last two years we've had um, propositions come up. The last one was Prop 2. Everyone, well, not everyone, but it was voted down pretty soundly. And I think the, re- the message with that was, nah, we're going to burn wood. Here's Fairbanks. We're going to burn with. Mm-hmm. So now, the same people, me included, you included, that voted that down because we tell ourselves we're educated enough to do so, our tax dollars that we're giving the federal government is going coming back to us to tell us that we're wrong. So we vote something down, mm-hmm. and we pay our taxes. Mm-hmm. The tax money comes back to say, you were wrong. Now we're going to re-educate you. No, no, it, get, it gets even better, Josh. You know what the vote was to accept that money? Um, I can think of one who wouldn't have, and that's about it. There was two who didn't. It was the, There was one absent, and that was uh, Guy Satley. He was absent from the vote. The, the vote was six in favor and two against. It was Natalie Howard and Michael Dukes who voted <laughs> not to take the money. Everybody else said Sure, let's go with the education or re-education money. Let's, Matt Watt voted for it? Yeah, Matt Watt voted for it. Oh, well, shoot, we're going to have to get him back on. Maybe we need to re-educate him. Yeah, no joke. Well, <laughs> Love you, Matt, if you're listening. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, well, we've we've generated a couple of phone calls, Josh. Would you like to go to the phones and see what's going on? Yeah. If by some chance I uh, have a brain fart and drop you off the line, please call right back, okay? Okay. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller, and welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hey, this is Bill. Bill, go ahead. Hey, I'd like to educate the EPA. We heat our house at least eight months out of the year. It cost me $1,200 for wood and $4,000 for fuel. Hmm. Well, you do, know, I, that, do I need to say any more? I think you do, Bill, because obviously you have been brainwashed by big trees. The, 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 you know, I, so a lot of people complain about big oil, but obviously the real problem here in Fairbanks is big tree. Big, big lumber is going out there and brainwashing you to think that somehow it's more economic to burn wood when, in fact, everybody knows that the best thing you can possibly do is continue their slavery. I mean, uh, your servitude. I mean, uh, continue the subsidy to the government and, and continue to burn heating oil. You know what? The government will help you out with that. You know, I would love to burn oil at a reasonable price. I would love to burn natural gas. Anybody out there for natural gas? But how about this? Until then, I cannot afford to spend $4,000 a year, so I will continue to burn wood with or without the permission. I have no choice. Well, you know what, brother? Even if if we had natural gas today, they, they come up to your door, here's some natural gas. Can we hook it up to your house? What would it take for you to get your house ready to burn natural gas? Oh, quite a bit. At least $3,000. I mean, the, con- the conversion over to natural gas is going to cost every single household at least $3,000. You're talking about $4,000 a year to burn diesel just to convert to natural mm. gas. You're talking about an, an upfront expense of $3,000 per household. So now we've got Representative Steve Thompson, God bless his soul, saying that he is going to advance a program that's going to help the state pay for everybody to get that conversion done. Oh, wow. wow. And it's going to be free, right? No, well, to us, of co- well, yeah, because where's that money coming from? It's going to be t- taken from the oil companies, right? To help us pay for the conversion to get us off oil and onto natural gas, which is also in control of the oil company, so really it doesn't really matter, does it? Now, here, here's something to think about, though. Steve Thompson's a businessman, right? Yep. Or at least he was. I wonder if he would go out and, when he was in business, stock his shelves full of things that people might need 10 years down the road. Mm. You know, it's 55 below at my house right now as we speak. I think I'm going to go throw another log on the fire. God bless you guys. <laughs> Thanks for the call. 458 Talk is a number of you've got something to add to the conversation. Uh, well, Josh, obviously, you know, you you, uh, you leave town uh, for a day or two, and look what happens. It all goes to hell. Not only wow. not only do we have the borough assembly voting to uh, continue to suckle on the government teat, when now we also have our own representatives, our state representatives, who we thought we w- um, were supporting the idea of liberty, basically also advocating for us to continue to re- receive largesse and subsidies from the government. And and it's 40 to 55 below here, all because you're gone. I think it's all related right. to you. Yeah. I'll try to come home. I, <laughs> I'm just disappointing about Mr. Thompson, but he, he's a Republican, right? Uh, yes, he is. And, and you know, it, just like all Republicans, they also believe that the I, – I know I'm printing with a very broad stroke, but I'm really hoping to stir things up because there are some people out there that belong to the party, the, the, the Republican Party who I think still believe in liberty. However, by supporting the Republican Party, they are still supporting the machinations which lead to continued looking to the government only for a solution. Well, I think that's uh, just more – firepower for us, so to speak, when, I mean, day after day, we ask, what is the difference between the two parties? Republicans are supposed to be small government, right? We hear that all the time. I have since I was a little kid. What's the difference? How can you be small government and say, I'm going to get the government to pay for, huh? That doesn't add up. That does not add up. I'm, uh, all right, four, five, eight, talk. The market can't bear it. What makes us think that the government can? Why do you think we're in such so much debt? Well, you, you know, 
do with the market won't because it's not profitable. You heard about what happened in Nome with uh, them missing the the fuel barge last fall and how they they hired on their own uh, a an a Russian okay. oil tanker to bring in the fuel that they needed. Now along uh-huh. the way they had to make sure they got the correct permissions from the government to get them there because of course the EPA knows better what Nome needs than Nome does. But they did they got permission to get that ship there, and then they got help from the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard uh, Cutter Healy, which is the only functional icebreaker in the entire U.S. fleet, by the way. They got it to Nome, and I, I believe they are looking at right now, uh, as of yesterday morning, they were about six miles off the coast of Nome, so basically they're there. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, a day or two before they actually get the fuel offloaded. What would, yeah. did, what did they... Yeah. Now, okay, oh, cool. first and foremost, I want to make the point that Nome found the solution through a private company I will find them. because the government could not help them. They actually asked the government first. The government could not help them. They found their own solution through the private, uh, private sector. However, what did Nome do before they had fuel oil? Because people well, were there before diesel. They burned gold. They burned gold. I knew it. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Good morning, Steve. This is Mark. Mark, go ahead. What's on your mind? Well, I called the borough up to see about getting a wood cutting permit. And in a borough that's larger than most states in lower 48, we have approved wood cutting lots that have poplar and birch. So, something wrong with that picture. Okay. <clears throat> in other words, it's not exactly the best wood to cut poplar and cottonwood. Uh, and only three little woodlots for an area this big just doesn't make much sense to me. But as sure the Lord is, there is liberty. <laughs> it might only be in your mind, though, brother. And no king but Jesus out here, guys. <laughs> good luck, Mark. 458 Talk is the number, and good morning. Who's this? Uh, good morning, Steve. It's Natalie. Natalie, thank you so yes. much. I hope you don't mind me uh, stealing part of our conversation to share on no, the air today. No, not, not at all. I was, I was excited about it, and I heard you talk a little bit about um, borough stuff and the $800,000, and um, I wanted to touch on something that Josh said, which he was talking about it in about government spending and what the market will bear. I, I think, you know, let the, the, if the market will bear it, you know, you know, do it. But that's exactly how we've gotten our, we have gotten into this debt situation, because Part of the air quality issue, a, a totally separate part that you, you hit on, is that the people who are getting this money, you know, are kind of the one step removed, kind of the quasi quasi university type groups, where the university is always competing for you know grants and research dollars and everything like that. And as that as that pool gets smaller and smaller, as they become more university uh, research type agencies, um, they need to find new revenue stream and it's not market revenue it's government revenue so a lot of you know so you you can name your problem name your problem whether it's air quality or you know some a health issue you can get the public behind or a sustainability goal and i'm not saying that the you know the problems are true not true but name your problem and um you know a lot of these groups are getting into a lot of municipal municipal uh, share of, of, of money, if you will, you know, the tax That's, dollars. Wait, wait, aren't these people supposed to be, I mean, the whole point of being a land-grant university is that they're supposed to be getting their research money from the private sector, aren't they, Natalie? Uh, well, and it, well, not, no, land-grant land universities were, were set up and, and have direct public funding, you know, at, at a certain level, and that's kind of also one of my points is that, you know, we're with the opinion setters of our, as anybody who's read our uh, the Rothbard um, Anatomy of the State, the opinion setters of the of our culture right now are the universities, and, and you know, like that or not, um, but you know, when the universities have to start looking elsewhere than their own university system for funding, you know, into the municipalities, which you know, we never were intending it. You know, this is like a spongy line here between mm-hmm. the municipality and the borough. Are were we ever supposed to? I mean, is local government supposed to be in the business of of uh, behavior training citizens? Natalie, the the local governments aren't supposed to be in the business of business. I, the whole <laughs> the whole point of this is that they are. I mean, this is something that the market is not buying. They're peddling well, they're peddling something that nobody wants, and therefore they have turned to the government to get somebody to to get the money for it because the government can go out and take the money by force. 
yes, you can you could say that about every single you know so many things going on at, at the at the borough right now. Um, and it's not that they're not nice ideas and that people don't really want them, but I think people have to start realizing that if if a, if a business or if the market could do it, the government doesn't need to be in the business. Hey, Natalie, let me ask you a question. If if I made Pampers for red faced baboons, would you mm-hmm. want to would you want to buy them? I, I no, I personally wouldn't want to buy them. Uh, okay, if I couldn't find anybody to buy them, does that mean that nobody wants them, or just that I haven't found the right person to pay for them? Because I know in my heart that everybody needs them. They just don't know that they need them. The yet. Maybe I should take it over to the borough and get them to give me a grant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they'll do it for for baboon pam- uh, pampers. And that's really where it comes, what it comes down to. And in a lot of the things at the borough, you know, they they, they get through because they're these nice ideas. And you know, excuse me, we're we're helping we're helping others, or you know, people are in need, or something like that. But if you look, and this is the conversation I've had with the other assembly members, if you look at you know the people who are coming down and really getting a lot of the services, I'm not saying that they're not you know using them, but they're incredibly subsidized, and they're not people of need. You know, who who any of us would categorize as, as need, and that's you know, being kind and not calling it stealing. But, um, you know, the, the system is right now that, that, that we're providing services that are, that are you know, just, just mere wants. And, well, no, no, um, no, no, no. Everybody needs parks, Natalie. Oh, yeah. Every, everybody needs a dog park. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs parks and rides. Everybody needs the pools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We would have and those if, if people only uh, realize how much money we've been diluted for so long that the market doesn't get to work the way it's supposed to because the government's diluted it so bad. But if if you get them out of the way, it's really simple and it actually does work because it did for hundreds, well, thousands of years. Wait, wait, get get the private the market out of the way, huh? Get the private market out of the way and just let the government take our money and give us what well, we that's need. What, that's what's happened. But if we would get if. It wasn't so diluted, I mean, because now it's so hard for people to go, well, if the government wasn't there, how would this happen? And exactly. you have to think that it's because the government's diluted the free market so bad. If we want something and people are willing to pay for it, then the market, somebody will find a way to provide the service. If no one's willing to provide a service, we don't need it. Mm-hmm. So that means that there's no profitability in it. There's no reason for it except for someone wanting it, and but they're not willing to pay for it, which is why we have government, so we can say, well, I want this. Go steal the money from him and give me this. We just understand that the market would take care of everything that we need if the government didn't dilute it down. We would have natural gas if it was profitable, I guarantee. <clears throat> you are the- some kind of a capitalist zealot, aren't you, Josh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, four five eight talk is the number. Natalie, do you want to stay on the line too, or shall I? I can stay on it. Could I just add something to the, the the market thing that Josh went off on? Go right ahead. Well, we, and, and Josh and I were talking about this before too. I, I think that not only are people not used to the government not being there and they don't know how it would work, the government system and 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 when I mean the government system, I mean you know our pure municipal systems and stuff like that. But it also works for subsidized like. Uh, bureaucracies and, and university systems and stuff like that, they're not operating in a pure market system. So it's a, it's a very contentious system. I mean, politics and, and what goes on in the municipality, you hear about, you know, these we have to make this bipartisan because we have to make these compromises, and, you know, you have to give a little bit and t- for me to take. And it's all a compromise, give, take. The market is, is really much more harmonic or, or much more um, less... Um, you know, compromising there. It's a, it's an economic harmony that can that's there with all production systems, and I think that's something that people are scared of because they're they they feel there's more uncertainty there um, because they don't have somebody guaranteeing their success for whatever idea they come up with with government force. All right, Natalie, I am going to try something here that I, okay. I hope works. I'm going to try to keep you on the line and Josh on the line and bring in another. We're going to make this a chat fest, all right? So if, if I drop one of you, please call back on. 458-TALK is the number. Let's go on to the next call. Good morning, caller. You are on as well. Who's this? This is Gene. Gene, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I think I got uh, something that relates to the whole subject now. I had a, a friend here, a neighbor of mine, that got called up yesterday for his hydraulic heater that was making too much smoke. Well, it so happened that he 
went out and looked at it, and all there was coals. And at the same time, his neighbor, who was downwind, walked up at his place and and uh, seen that there was no smoke, and it was the, his place was the direction that the smoke was going in. Okay? And then last night, out of a patriot's history of the United States, on Chapter 2 at the start of it, it was saying that uh, one of the problems in... 1763 that brought on the revolution is that the people there quit feeling like citizens and started feeling like subjects. And I think that explains our problem. Natalie, how do you agree, uh, how do you um, respond to that? Well, I think that's no, I, I think that that's true. And I and uh, just some comments, um, and I'm going to paraphrase from the assembly from others. Um, you're dealing with people with different worldviews and belief systems at a core. You know, the, you could substitute the. It, the air quality for something different. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking he's alluding to air quality. And this $800,000 that was passed was, um, you know, was out there for behavioral changing um, type of education. Now, now I, 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 I hope that education is not about behavior changing. I know a lot of people really think that maybe training is like that, but you don't treat people like that. We have, we're consciously aware people, and that's, you know, the government's not there to behavior train the citizens. Um, and people are are feeling feeling that, and one of the reasons I think that they're they're doing this is eight hundred thousand. I I do think that they have a belief system, and they, there's a belief. Some assembly members have a belief system that this is you know this is really a problem and we have to do it this way. And there were some comments at a work session that were like you know what are what are you they would ask the staff going to do to um to to make the 30% of the population here um, believe, you know, that don't believe that this is a problem, believe. You know, what are you going to do to to use that $800,000 to do that? And I, you know, th- that kind of talk makes me feel very uncomfortable and, and not, you know, this is this is well beyond what we're supposed to be doing. I, I hope that was a clear enough answer, but... Thank you. Um, we're just down it down our throats. One way or the other, they're going to get what they want. Yeah, and and but you. Have to I couldn't hear what Natalie was saying. Uh, All right, but uh, that's you, know, you guys are sharing. You guys are sharing the same line. Burn out. It was uh-huh. almost time to put wood in, and everybody knows that when it's down to the last little bit of coals, it's uh, it's not smoking much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks very much for the phone call. Appreciate yep. it. Four five eight. Talk is a number. We're going to move on to the next one. Good morning, caller. Who's this? That'd be me. That might be you. Depends on who okay, it is. Okay, good. I what's didn't your, hear that a little quick. What's your name? Uh, Natalie. Wait, wait. Your, na- your name is Natalie? No, no, sir. It's Gray Wolf. Gray Wolf. Go ahead. I got one thing to say to Natalie. Natalie, run for governor. I would vote for you in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Natalie Howard, thank you very much for uh, being here with us. If you'd like to stay on through the break, we'll try to keep that happening. Uh, Josh Bennett is also on the line with us calling from an undisclosed location this morning. I'm Steve Floyd here in the studios in downtown Fairbanks where we've got so much ice fog that I can barely see the borough building right across the river. We'll be right back after the news. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. I am Steve Floyd, <laughs> and uh, joining me on the phone right now uh, from an undisclosed location this morning is Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises uh, for all of your trucking and construction needs. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Luke. All right, looks like we dropped. Uh, looks like we missed uh, Natalie there. We dropped her uh, her line. Uh, Natalie, if you'd like to call back in, you are welcome to do so. Natalie Howard was uh, joining us for that last segment there. She's one of our borough assembly people. And, you know, we kind of got down this path this morning of uh, the actions taken by the borough assembly on Thursday night, voting basically, I mean, the only thing they did was they voted to accept $800,000 from the federal money, from the, you know, it's it's basically just grant money. Uh, As far as I know, I don't know if there's anything in particular the borough has to do to qualify to get the money, if there are any strings attached or hoops to jump through. Is there anything inherently wrong with that josh i mean all, all they did was voted to accept some free money 
that basically is just going to go right back into the local economy. I mean, look, it's going to media. I should be happy that there's $800,000 <laughs> $800, coming into my line of work. Yeah, I uh, I wouldn't have taken it. You wouldn't have I mean, taken it. Why not? Being, the federal government's bankrupt for one. So, I mean, people can't figure that out. You gotta, you're blind or dumb. Um, they're accepting the money to educate us, though. That drives me nuts. Basically, to re-educate us. Because they think that we're too stupid to know what we want or know what we need. So they're going to educate us in the way that they want us to be. Because most of us are out of school now, so they can't use that to dumb us down. So they got to get some commercials to say, look, you guys are just dumb. Bow down to your local borough assemblymen and thank them for saving your life, for spending your money, and basically running your life the way they want them to. And, you know, I don't think it's going to last much longer like that because we started off in the beginning. People, being the show today, people are changing their mind. There's a pretty big ground flow right now that I was saying with Ron Paul, and I don't think it's just him. It's his message that he's been talking about, liberty, less government, like real less government, cutting the EPA out. I mean, no more EPA, uh, no more education system. And in the past, it's always been whack job thinking. And it's really becoming mainstream now because people are realizing, for one, if we're going to have this government, it has to follow the Constitution. And if it would, we wouldn't have the debt that we have. We wouldn't have the government telling us what we are supposed to do with our lives. We wouldn't have the EPA. None of this would be affecting us right now. This conversation about what smoke would have never came out because the EPA would not be around. That's the solution. Not borrowing, borrow, yeah, that's what we're doing, borrowing money to re-educate us on why they are correct and why we are stupid. Well, if this is the government so money, though, I mean, Josh, what if they just printed the money? That can't be bad, right? They're just creating more money, creating more wealth, putting it into the economy, right? Yeah. Making your dollar worth less. I looked up today, the dollar today, $1 in 1960 is what would take $7.46 to purchase the same thing. You know? Pretty close to a minimum wage, right? That's exactly right. So minimum wage is right now at a dollar an hour, 1960. What was the minimum wage in 1960? I don't know. It wasn't uh, around. Uh, well, I'm just I'm just uh, pointing out some comparisons to be made that perhaps with the government interference with the market system by requiring a particular minimum be paid might have something to do with the corresponding increase in the prices of all our goods and services. Just an idea. <laughs> Four well, five. Go ahead. The, what, because of the printing of the money and not having a gold standard backing it, because when you have gold backing your dollars, you can only print as much as you have in gold. The way we have it now, we can print as much as we want, so we can fight every war in the world, and we can produce every program and fund every program in the world. Because of that, your dollar today, well, the dollar from 1960, and I mean, the Federal Reserve was in there. This, when the Federal Reserve was first put in, I think our dollar is worth two cents, in 1913, has the same purchasing power as a dollar right now. Wow. 458-TALK is the number. This is Patriots Lament. You ready to go back to the other lines? Right. 458-TALK. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is Red here. Red, go ahead. I burn wood and I burn fuel oil. I'd like to burn coal, but it's pretty messy and I don't like to mess. But if people think that... Uh, uh, natural gas is going to be a cheaper way to heat your home. You're crazier in hell. It, the price of uh, natural gas or propane has went up over eight dollars in the last three years. Gas, uh, gasoline, and diesel went up about a dollar forty, dollar fifty, in some places. Uh, if any of uh, your callers live on Cana Ridge, have them look out over the valley and tell you exactly where all the smoke is and how the refinery smoke going out and right down to the ground. There you go. I'll let it go there. Thanks for the call, Red. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. All right. Uh, if you'd like to call in and participate in the show, 458-TALK is the number. All right, Josh, it's back to you. We've got uh, about 20 minutes left here today to try to make the case. You're saying that you think the solution basically is going to it's going to find itself. 
that at some point the government will not be able to sustain this. Uh, however, that that could be kind of messy, couldn't it? John? Uh, it could be messy the way it is right now. I, it's just on... You don't need these guys to tell us what we can and can't burn. I mean, haven't we... It's all... It's uh, old hat. We've gone to the polls a couple times, told them how it's going to be. Oh, boo-hoo, but what is the EPA going to do about it? What are, what are they going to do about it? I've always asked that question. What what can they do? They're not going to send Fort Wayne right over and kill us all, would they? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the they wouldn't you, they wouldn't possibly consider sending in uh, federal agents to to round up Alaskans, I and mean, that would never happen here, right? I mean, certainly no. not with the not with the, without the correct warrants, <laughs> right? Exactly. But I mean, even the borough. What if they do pass a law? I mean, they educate us, and we finally get so dumb that we believe everything they tell us, and we let them pass a law that says we can't burn wood. What would happen then? I mean, they don't have any police powers, do they? Not yet, but all they have to do is just vote themselves the police powers, Josh. They've already got code enforcement officers. So even right. though they don't technically have the power, they have the framework to go out and exercise that power. Well, maybe they need to, instead of trying to educate us, maybe they need to be educated to see what happens when people finally get tired of governments trying to run their lives day in and day out and day in and day out, every aspect of their life. People... Uh, we actually have a history that we, Americans finally get tired of it. We haven't for a long time, but we do have a history of that where we just say, eh, no more. You're done. You know what? Yeah, one of our founders made a reference to the idea that if we ever, once we lost our liberty, we would never be able to regain it. Do you remember that That's quote? That's pretty interesting. I think, that there, I think that he had a lot of truth in that. That was John Adams. He said, liberty lost, it can never be regained. And I think that he saw that once we lost our constitutional, quote-unquote, republic, once we lost that, we can never go back to it. And I agree. I think that the founding fathers saw that once that page had been turned, we'd turn over another page. We'd go for a new liberty and a better liberty that would be even more less government or none. I mean... We should have seen from 200 and some odd years ago, here's how it's like with a limited government, which lasted a couple of years, really. It didn't last long at all. And they started, I mean, right off the bat, Washington fought his whiskey war, the whiskey rebellion. Um, it wasn't too far in where the 11th Amendment was passed. I wish people would read the 11th Amendment and how that came about and what that did to Americans right off the bat. 1790, I think it was. We went from being the sovereign citizens over the state to, no, nah, not so much. We don't like that. So we have lost this liberty that we had it's called a constitutional republic. That's fine. Let's move on. I don't think it can re- be replaced. We can, we've already seen that it, it doesn't work anyway. So let's move on. Let's move beyond it. Maybe we should just have a republic of Fairbanks. That's what happened after the fall of Rome. I mean, if you look at the historical context, after the Republic of Rome it turned into an empire and then it became uh, exclusively the rule of the whim of the emperor, and the Senate became less and less relevant, and eventually it was just a, a one-man rule, uh, and everybody there was a slave, whether they actually were in shackles or not. When Rome finally collapsed, what rose up in its place were little mini-republics localized and i think that's really where freedom exists in the on the on the most practical scale anyway isn't it yeah it does and but unfortunately we have like our borough government we have there's nine assemblymen right and one mayor what makes us think that those people who are human beings and you're a human being i'm a human being what makes us think that they know how to run our lives better than we do just because they're elected to office, all of a sudden their IQ goes up, all of a sudden their ideas are better than ours, all of a sudden they're ruler. They get voted in so they're smarter than the rest of us? I don't buy that. I mean, most of them get voted in because they promise this or that. I mean, usually it's skin. But what makes a person who is corruptible just like any other person, who is 
has a finite mind just like anybody else, just because they get elected into office, automatically they know how to run your life. You, what do those nine people at the borough assembly have over any of us that they know how to run our life? Well, I think what they have, Josh, is they have our, not only our permission, but they have us requesting them to run our lives. How many, yeah. t- how many times have you heard people say, just tell us what to do? How many times have you I, I mean, even in, in, in terms of this re- this coming election, I've heard so many people talking about the Republican field as if somehow that's where the Savior is going to come from, saying, yeah. we, just need, we just need a good person to lead us. What we need is a good leader. What do you say to that? No. You have Don't. to you have to be your own good leader, right? You have to be a good leader in your family. And how to be, we how, don't. Right? That's why I love the the Ron Paul analogy. I don't think that he is the answer, but the message that he is bringing, espousing to people, that is catching on. So what's he saying? You don't need the government. And he's running for the president, right? And he's saying you don't need it. You don't need these EPA. I mean, the three letter acronym word. Uh, organizations in our government. You don't need them. You don't need this. You don't need that. You can take care of yourself. I got an email the day this lady was complaining about her social security and she was, it was a letter to her senator and she was all mad about social security benefits aren't as good as they were or they raised the retirement age and she's been paying into Medicaid forever and now it's harder to get that involved. Well, it's your own fault. Why are you relying on the government for your retirement? Why are you relying on the government for Medicaid? It's unconstitutional in the first place. And what she should be mad at is her grandparents for allowing Social Security to be implemented in the first place, for allowing Medicaid and Medicare to be implemented in the first place. And and she should be <laughs> mad at herself, Josh, for not preparing yeah. for in for the future, back when she had a chance, so that she wouldn't have to be dependent on that's that state why, subsidy. That's how I looked up uh, why I looked up the uh, inflation, what dollar was today compared to 1960, because she said in 1960 is when she started paying into Social Security. She couldn't figure out why we have to... She was blaming Congress for spending her Social Security money, and that's why she has to wait, why they want to raise the, the age limit for retirement. No, because your dollar that you put in back in 1960 isn't worth anything. It costs $7.46 today for that same dollar. We can't afford that. Hey, Josh, we got all four lines on hold, and and I'd also like to interject just uh, a suggestion for an action point. Natalie earlier made a reference to Rothbard, uh, the book Anatomy of the State, although I don't think she she mentioned it by name. I'm rereading it this week. It is a real easy read, but it is one of those things that as you read it, you're like, ugh. That's exactly right. I mean, it is intuitive, it is easy to read, and it is something that which will, if you will allow yourself to really think about the issues that it raises, it will change your perspective. So may I suggest as an action point today that people get a copy of Rothbard's Anatomy of the State, really short yeah. book. And we can throw it up. I'll throw it up on our website, uh, link to it. I think we have in the past, I'll, I'll re-throw it up there um, where you can download it right to your computer and read it from the music too. Beautiful. 458 Talk is the number. You ready to take some more phone calls? Yeah. All right. Good morning, good. caller. You are on Patriots Lament. Who's this? This is Gray Wolf again. Gray Wolf again. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I hear all this talk, and, you know, to me, that's all that it is. And no, I, I commend you. I commend Natalie. Because uh, you're doing something. You're getting the word out. But, but I'm, and I'm including myself as partly being guilty of it also is just, just, sitting around and griping about things, not doing anything, not getting out there. We need to get our friends, our family members. We all need to get together and go out and do something about it. I'm not talking violence or anything like that. By no means. I'm talking about petitioning, uh, uh, doing everything we can within our rights and not letting them tell us what our rights are. Well, Gray Wolf, let, let, me, let me stop you there for just a second. Let me ask you a follow-on question to that, because you see, we have a group here in Fairbanks that's doing exactly that right now, the Occupy Fairbanks group. And yet, how many people do you know that would consider themselves like Tea Party members or, or even lovers of liberty who are going out there and joining with them? 
that are setting up their own tents down there in violation of the borough code to exert their right to say, you do not have the right to come and tell me what I can do with this public land to, to go out there and petition the government. How many people do you know that are a part of that? I can tell you right now, you unless you know the Occupy Fairbanks people, you don't know any of them because I there's don't. only three. There's only I three don't. people doing that. Three? Three. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go join them. I, I wish you would because, you know what, I'm so sick and tired of people painting the Occupy Fairbanks people as if somehow... They are just these violent radicals there on the other side of the political spectrum. We are buying into the major party lingoism and and allowing ourselves to be divided. You think about it, brother. Either we hang together or we're going to hang separately. Who said that? Was it Ben, yeah. Fra- was it ben well, Franklin? Are you going to be the piss hand or are you going to be the shoe? Hey, exactly. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the call. We have to keep talking about it. I mean, if uh, you realize that a few hundred years ago, I know we talked about this before, liberty was not even a thought in your mind. Private property was not even thought of, okay? And if people hadn't been thinking about those things and talking about those things, we wouldn't even be discussing the right to do anything. It takes people talking about things. I mean, liberty advances a few hundred years ago. You didn't even have the right to do jack, nothing. You had no right. Now we do because people are talking about it, thinking about it, a lot of surprising about things. But we also have to think the Declaration of Independence, what was that whole thing about? It was a written document that said, here's our grievances. And they were laying out those grievances against the king to whom? We have petitioned the king for this. Uh We petitioned for this. We petitioned for this. But the Declaration itself, who was it an appeal to, Josh? God. It was an appeal to God. How many people do we know that although they may say they may give lip service to some idea of God, how many people actually practice that in their daily lives? Well, I, yeah. well, I think Graywell had a good point. And I, I would suggest people maybe read the Declaration of Independence and read it slow and understand instead of just like, yeah, it's something some guy wrote 200 and some years ago. He was writing down what Graywell just said, petitioning the state. There's nothing wrong with doing that. We should. Instead, we go along with doing what the state tells us is the only way that we can fix stuff is to go to their election. What if we just, as a society, decided, eh, we're not voting anymore. We're going to do this. We're going to protest. We're going to petition. We're going to go about it a totally different way than going down to your state-sponsored elections that give us the same thing over and over and over and over. We need to get away from that. Quit participating in the problem. Josh, have you have you seen the numbers in the last, I, I don't know, you could actually probably go back the last 20 years or so. Consistently, we've seen numbers around maybe 24%. About one in four people are still actually going out and participating in the elections. Oh, that's great. I mean, you look at the, but look at the presidential election. More people than ever have gone to do these presidential elections. And for what? We need to quit looking at their answers to the problem, come up with our own answers. And petitioning the state is one thing we can do. Just tell them, we're done. Quit complying. Quit going along with what they want us to do. Start doing our own thing. That's what they did in 1776, 1770s. They finally said, nah, we're done. We are done. That's when the soldiers came in from the British. But anyway, let's go to the phone. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're next on Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hey, Steve. It's Natalie calling back in. <laughs> Natalie, thanks for calling back in. I've been listening on hold, and, and um, so you just essentially answered my question I had about what do we do at the local level. And you talked about participating in the government process, and I was I'm going to hang up, but I was going to ask you, what more can I do? I mean, do you think that I feel now after entering the political process that it is really not the best way to make effectual change, but I don't really have a good um, uh, so, uh, an alternative solution for myself. And what do you think I can do as, as an assembly member uh, to help this? So I'll, I'll hang up and I can listen to what you guys talk about. Thanks, Natalie. Appreciate that. You know, as, as she is uh, hanging up and transitioning off the phone there, Josh, I think Natalie expresses, I think, the 
embodiment of what so many of us have wanted in a borough assembly person over the last uh, couple of years that she's been on. She has stood up against the big government. She's stood up against the, the free money, the ties to the federal government. She has stood up against all of these things, and she has been shouted down. She has been uh, pushed aside. They've been trying to, they've tried to make her irrelevant. They've been trying to do all of these things to make her ineffective so that right now, you just heard her. She feels like she's not effective. She feels like quitting. What do you say to her? I would say that she's absolutely effective. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going after her. If, if you're not getting shouted down, if you're not getting attacked, if the haters aren't hating you, you're doing something wrong. That's exactly what it is. Everyone has their own part in this. And not everyone can run for borough assembly. Not everyone can get elected to borough assembly. But when you have someone like Natalie Howard, of course it's effectual. If she's not getting the results maybe that she wants immediately, but she gets to come on your show, she gets to come on here, mm-hmm. she gets to point these things out, she gets, she's on the inside and sees things that none of us would know about. So of course it's, it's having a huge effect. They hate her so much because she has an effect. Otherwise, if they didn't, then I'd say, yeah, you're worth it. So then, then take it take it that step farther. Like what she was saying, what she can, what can she do more? Assuming that she stays with it, assuming that she keeps on in that position, that she keeps on saying no, 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 and keeps on getting outvoted. Like uh, Thursday night, six to two, she was one of two people who said no. I don't think we should take the federal money to re-educate the public with this pro- this propaganda campaign. She was only one of two that voted against it. Assuming that she does that, what else can she do? What more can she do? I don't know if there. I don't know if there is more you can. You know what? I, I, I have a suggestion. Anything wrong with doing that? What's wrong with doing that? I have a suggestion, and and okay. and this just is a suggestion which I I've actually already talked with Natalie about it offline, but I'll I'll make it public that I think what we need is somebody on the inside to work with the legal department and to work with maybe try to find one or two other people on the assembly to introduce a measure and then possibly get some help on the outside to turn it into a public initiative, which then we can get the signatures for and get it on the ballot to get every single one of the borough powers up for vote. Every single one of them. Let the people decide if we want to continue having animal control. Let the people decide if we want to continue to have trash. Let the people decide if we want to continue to have libraries. Let the people decide if we want to continue to have a parks and recreation department that employs more people than the entire populace of Zimbabwe. I'm, I'm sorry, that was a, a little bit of hyperbole, Josh. I'm wondering about that, though. If we did that, would the borough be able to use borough money to... Adver- advertise against... The they've country. done it before. They've done it before on the air quality issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've done it before on the IM program. They actually used money, uh, borough money, to run ads to try to scare people not to vote down the IM program, which has now gone away because even the EPA in their vast wisdom recognized that the science no longer supported that program. Well, I think one of our biggest problems that people that want to see change have is that they see it, their time frame is out of whack. We want action now. And it doesn't work like that. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of years to get to where we are right now. It's going, it may take hundreds of years to change it. I mean, sorry to blow anyone's bubble up, but it's true. But it doesn't mean that we're not responsible to keep fighting for it. But we have to just do the right thing. I mean, very well sitting, we need to get out and petition, go protest, whatever. Yeah, that's part of it. You may not get a change today, but it will come. It doesn't matter what we see today or tomorrow. We can't get discouraged from it. I mean, look at, i got to go back to Ron Paul. Four years ago, he couldn't get 8 or 9% of the populace to even listen to him. Now he's up to 25%. People are waking up. That's four years. Hey, Josh, real quick, so, uh, as we as we still have all four lines on hold, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all four. What is our contact number do you, or, or contact information? You've got a website for Patriots yeah, Lament? Yeah, website is Patriots Lament, all one word, dot blogspot.com. And the email? email Patriots Lament at Gmail. Com. All right, thank you. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to correct something that I had said 
last Saturday when I called into the show on January 7th. Uh, it's my policy to always correct myself if I say anything. It's not quite <laughs> Appreciate right. it. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one of your hosts that's not here today uh, asked me on the radio last week, he said, which party is for less government control? And then I said, the Republican Party in general. And then he said, give me a Republican president who has shrunk the size of government. And I said, well, I guess during the Eisenhower administration, they kind of had the Taft-Hartley Act. Anyway, that wasn't quite right. The Taft-Hartley Act was passed in Congress, by Congress, in 1947, which was before Eisenhower came into office. So that's actually a Democratic yeah, administration. Yes, yes and Truman. Truman vetoed the law, mm. but they had enough votes, good Democrats and good Republicans, to override Truman's veto and were able to pass the Taft-Hartley Act, which took some of the onerous things out of the uh, National Labor Relations Act, because they were having tremendous amounts of strikes right after World War II, shutting down industry and everything, so they had to curtail union power, which comes directly from the power of the federal government. So so that was an example of uh, Thanks, good Randy. Democrats and good Republicans working together. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate the phone call. about the Eisenhower administration, though. That was the first, must have been the last administration where federal government didn't actually grow. All right. During- guess, guess what? Uh, we're done? Yeah, we're at the end of the show. <laughs> Once again, uh, action point for today, get a copy of Rothbard's Anatomy of the State. Uh, it, it's available for free download, and I believe uh, we're going to try to get a, a, a link again on patriotslament.blogspot.com, right? Yes, sir. All right, thanks for being here, Josh, at least uh, from the, for the phone from an undisclosed location. Up next, it's Health Talk on KFAR. Have a great day. KFAR Fairbanks, 660 a.m. Online at KFAR660.com.